All right. Morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn up the volume just a little bit. All right. So welcome to our last lecture of, of new material appropriately titled Endings. Yeah, First one of other announcement. We kind of made the unofficial decision. If you're sitting anywhere in like those back clustered rows, move forward. We don't have many people today and we're going to be doing a lot of discussing. And there's some small print on the slides as well. And I know a lot of people can't even see back there. So if you're way in the back, come forward. There's a seat right here next to Madeline, who's lovely. There's seats up front. Come down to us. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go ahead and go over some very key class announcements, starting with the most important, obviously, the viewing party, December 5th, 7th. <laughs> um, from 7 to 9, it's in Green Law. We'll put it... Um, on Sakai, but just to remind you again, please come. There'll be snacks and popcorn and two very small poodles that I own that will be running about. So if that's not enticement enough, definitely come and, and say goodbye to your TAs. It'll be good, like one of the last times we see you outside of the final, where which I think will be a little bit more structured. Um, the other announcements, your reflection paper assignment, that's your last assignment for class. It's 10% of your final grade. If you have questions about the grade breakdown, hold them. I'm going to pass it off to Paul. Kind of like Jane <laughs> said, uh, Dr. Thilkill said, it's, it's going to be one of those either you do it and you get all the credit or you don't. We're not looking for really specific criteria. We made an assignment sheet with lots of suggestions for how to complete this assignment, but it truly is reflecting on what you learned, what resonated, what's your take homes, kind of all that stuff. So it's very, very open-ended. Uh, please don't stress about doing it the right way. It's literally just doing it. Just complete it and submit it, and that is will suffice. That's plenty. Um, but regardless, if you want ideas, there is an assignment sheet. It's on Sakai, I guess, under assignments. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the intended goal is to December third, but I think we basically said it's fine if it's turned in. Is that what we did? Six, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it'll kind of be like this last assignment where you had a window to submit it. So if you submit it any time before December 6th. Yeah. yeah. And as always, whatever we put on Sakai, you know, when you turn in your assignments that um, it's usually in red, like the deadline, that is the hard and fast deadline. As soon as you turn it after and after that, it's late. Yeah. You, Lisa? What is December? Uh, the viewing party. Yeah, the viewing party is December 5th. I knew it. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. It is a Thursday. So we have our last class December 3rd. Wednesday, obviously, we don't meet, and then it'll be that Thursday, December 5th. Other questions? So reflection paper, I, we can pull it up. It's on Sakai. Uh, maybe pull it up during class and just make sure it makes sense. And what's the next thing? Oh, yeah. This I will. I think I have it pulled up. Really? Oh my God, I feel like Jane not able to. Uh, this is hard. There we go. All right, more announcements. If you've ever taken a class with me, I guess Kieran is not here. Yes, she is. Um, I always do this. I make a Google Doc, an editable, editable Google Doc for all students to include any resources you might want to share with the class. So this is anything that we found that resonated um, videos, papers, recent works that relate to everything we've been talking about. So if you want to kind of continue learning, continue reading in this subject matter, please add stuff to it or uh, look to it for reading suggestion materials. I might just put on there other really good, if you love fiction, um, I might put on some solid, incredible, like recent contemporary fiction that Paul and I both love. So authors like Jasmine Ward, Ocean Wong, people, if you love fiction and you love reading, and you have literature, they're kind of like the new um, truly literary voices. So those will be coming. So look at those at any time and continue reading in this subject matter because it's fascinating. And final, final, oh yeah, course evals. Please do them. I think you have to do two, one for Dr. Thrillkill lecture, one for your um, TAs. I think we've already discussed these. Please do them. Be honest, um, they are really important for Paul and I, professionalization, job market, all that good stuff. We definitely look at them, we definitely take them seriously. So please complete them. Um, and we've 
very much love being your your TAs. Uh, I think that. All right. So a few more announcements. Um, so just to clarify, a couple weeks ago, a Professor Thrillkill spontaneously asked for fifty-five word stories. Um, uh, we clarified, we, we checked with her, those were not promised as extra credit. So um, thank you for sharing those, um, but you won't be getting extra credit for those. However, uh, you will get extra credit for like the condolence letters, the thank you notes you sent in, and there's still other opportunities out there. So if you haven't taken advantage of them, keep those in mind. They're all listed in the uh, announcements on Sakai. Um, all right, so this is where it gets a little interesting. So if you go to Sakai and then the syllabus tab, there's the syllabus and then there's also a course policies document. We've updated that um, to clarify a few things as we're approaching the end of the term. We know you're all like concerned about grades. In that document, anything that's been updated is highlighted. Um, we've added specific grades for attendance, a clarification we got from Professor Thrail Kill. Um, roughly the idea is if you miss less than two classes, you get a 10 out of 10 uh, for attendance. Um, if you miss less than three, you get a nine out of 10, which could become a plus one um, for really exceptional like participation. Um, and so on and so on. So that's laid out in that document. We've also clarified how we're gonna determine final course grades. So like what is an A? And we're basically just following the default university standard. So a 93 or higher is an A. But we know some instructors like, have, have different uh, criteria, so we wanted to clarify that. And we'll do standard rounding. So like a 92.4 is an A minus, 92.5 rounds up to an A. And then finally to clarify the grading weights, um, for the majority of you, you did the Ackland assignment. So your first, your response essay one is 10% of your grade, response essay two is 15% of your grade, the Ackland assignment is 10%. And again, we did that because there's a learning curve, right? We can expect a little more from your second essay than your first, and then the Ackland was kind of this new genre you weren't really used to and this extra assignment. Um, so that adds up to 35%. If you didn't do the Ackland assignment, then your first essay is worth 15 and your second essay is worth 20%. It gets confusing, right? Sakai, right now you can see like what Sakai thinks your final course grade is. Obviously that doesn't include attendance or um, your illness narrative or your reflection, but at least you can get an idea of like where you're at. That's only accurate if you did the Ackland because Sakai doesn't know like how to deal with people who didn't do an extra assignment. So if you did not do the Ackland assignment, you'll have to kind of manually calculate that. And I'll be manually calculating your grades at the end of the term. So does that make sense? I know it's confusing. It's just Sakai can't differentiate between two different groups with two different grading schema. So we wanted to clarify that as well. That's um, cleared up in that document. And then, yeah, just a quick reminder, your final exam is Thursday, December 12th. Um, the, the period is 8 to 11, but Professor Thrillkill only thinks it's going to take about 90 minutes. So she's letting y'all sleep in a little bit, and we'll do it from 9.30 to 11 that Thursday um, here. But again, attendance is mandatory. That'll be the last day we're taking attendance. Um, and then putting that into Sakai. So any questions there on the announcements? Yeah. That's gonna come down to Professor Thrailkill. She'll, she'll be reporting that, however, for the, um, is it for the minor? I forget. Yeah, so she'll be, she'll be dealing with how to report that in terms of getting, making sure you get credit. It may be, for those of you in that situation, you might want to send her a reminder email. Um, but yeah, that's more on her end administratively. Any other questions? Yeah. So as far as we understand, it's not, I, I put exam in quotes just because it's mandatory to be here, but Professor Threlkill is going to have some uh, guest speakers and there's actually no exam. It's not part of your grade other than just you have to show up. Yeah. It's, um, she's yeah, just, blessed. yeah, yeah, your, ex, your exam is show up and listen to some guest uh, speakers talking about like, where do you go from here? What are some potential career paths? Um, and I'm sure there'll be time for Q&A. So yeah, there's no, you're almost done. You turn in the illness narrative, your last real requirement is this uh, reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ash. No, if you've missed, if that, if you've missed, oh, right, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. So that's, that's uh, Professor Thrail Kills, that's what she gave us, is if you miss less than two classes, you get nine out of ten with, but that could potentially become ten out of ten if you've had really good participation. Um, which a lot of you do. Um, so yeah, so that's Professor Threlkill's policy, and but we'll be determining that, if that helps. Yeah. 
<laughs> One would be less than two. I'm confused. Yeah. And again, a lot of you, and a lot of you have had excused absences, right? Extenuating circumstances, those don't count against you, right? So anytime we've marked you as excused or there's been some issue, that's not going to, that's not going to count. Um, all right. Final, final announcement. Um, Paul and I are in the midst of these illness narratives. You wrote them, you know, that was not a laborious task, but it is a labor. They're long. It's going to take us a while to work through these. Um, and I don't know about Paul, but I can just, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we both got an extreme amount of emails from students, which is not a bad thing. Um, but if we're not getting replies as quickly from us as usual, that's why there's just so many of you. There were a lot of last minute kind of shuffling around with the documents, with your submissions and all that. Since you already have the, had the extension, Paul and I kind of agreed that we weren't going to extend it any further unless you had really kind of extenuating circumstances or had worked on an extension beforehand. So we are keeping that hard and fast deadline. We're not responding. It's because we're swamped. Um, also, bear in mind that we might not be grading you as your TAs. So if you have any kind of remaining loose end kind of things with your papers, I guess, yeah, email us one more time. Um, and we'll try to get it to who will be grading it. But yeah, bear in mind, like I'm grading polls, Dr. Joe Kill is grading some of my students. So it was really important for you to kind of get them in, get them done, solid, published, over with. Um, I will try to work through my emails today to make sure I'm not leaving anyone out, but if our reply time is a little bit slower than usual, it's because there's a lot of you, these illness narratives are complicated, um, yeah. If for some reason we're not replying at all, you can always kind of send a follow-up email, but try to, yeah, get them in and have it be the end, because it's hard for us to kind of form them out to who's grading them at this point. Yeah. So Dr. Strip can also be going off the rubric that Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and we, we can always email her and kind of remind her that that's exactly what we're doing. But yeah, um, they'll be the exact same, certainly, as usual. I'm guessing she'll do line edits with track changes, which again, it's like important why you should upload like a Word document instead of a PDF. Kind of all these things we've been going over all semester. It needs to be done now. Um, yeah, but she should be using the rubric next to me. And I think we're all, I think we're going to get together and calibrate at the end to make sure all the grade, we're grading on a similar scale. Um, I think they're all going to be very high, so not to worry. Yeah, and with, with that in mind, um, it's like one of your final assignments and I know it could be tempting to get it back and just glance at your grade and file it away, but do look at the comments. We're going to give just as extensive feedback as we've been giving um, because you're ultimately here to learn. So make sure you look at our comments and use those moving forward in your education. Um, and also bear in mind over the holiday that we may be slower than usual. We're all traveling and so we may be slower to respond as well. Yeah, Edley. So. No, no. Sure. Yeah, Dr. Thrillkill originally, yeah, we had a, an aspirational objective of a week, so next Monday. I, I don't see that happening, um, <laughs> <laughs> mostly because like Paul and I have families, and we have holidays that we would, you know, we kind of would like to see and be you, with our family. You don't want my brother's um, grading your illness narratives, so yeah. I, I don't think that's going to happen. They are quite long. I mean, just imagine it takes us maybe like 30 minutes to read one and give comments and respond. So I would say hopefully by the very end of classes, by the very end of class, I think maybe, which would be, or by, the, or by the viewing party even. So yeah, next Wednesday, next Thursday. What are like grades due? Grades are due uh, 20, 48 hours after your final exam. So technically, we could grade until then, but because we're amazing, we're going to get them <laughs> through them and back to you. But yeah. yeah, we have until probably December 14th to calibrate and calculate and submit your final grades to Connect Carolina. Yeah, and I got, I got my other class to get done yeah. before that. So yeah, I'll be in trouble if I'm still grading at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, any other questions about announcements, grades? It's kind of why we did this. We knew as the semester came to a close, um, you guys would be understandably like, thinking about what that grade's going to be, so. Traveling. 
I'm only using this too because of the recording. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, all right, so let's get into, this is our last lecture of new material, right? Next Tuesday is our last lecture, but that'll be a wrap up. Um, so today's text, Letting Go, What Should Medicine Do When It Can't Save Your Life? by Atul Gawande from 2010. Um, first of all, where have we seen this writer's name before? Y'all should recognize this maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and if you do a if you do a search um, in your notes from around September 10th, you may see um, Professor Threlkill also uh, quoted him a few times, just thinking about the purpose of medicine and kind of this these new debates that have arisen based on like technological advances. Um, so, what does it mean to let go? This is the main title, right? We're thinking about endings. It's called letting go. So, titles are important. Just in general, when you hear the phrase "let go," what comes to mind? There's no wrong answer here. I heard, I heard a couple things. What now? Frozen. Frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. It took me a second. All right, I'm with you now. I did too. I was like prison. Um, yeah. Giving up. Okay. What else? I heard death. I heard what else? Rebirth. I mean, with kind of a certain kinds of death, you can have a, a rebirth, like a spiritual rebirth, a baptism. I really like that. And it gets us to think about the paradox of life itself, which is that life and death are wedded, right? You can't really have one without the other. Lovely. Uh, acceptance. Yeah. So maybe Debbie Barrett, like the dialectic acceptance change. I thought of like physical strain and like the difference between letting go. Absolutely. And then, yeah, kind of a release or respite from that. Yeah. Um, even just going back to the, um, the rebirth, I kept, I wanted to bring up like, like Janus, J-A-N-U-S, like Roman god of doorways, two-faced, facing the, the past and the future, or almost to New Year's, right? Um, January is the names, Janus is the namesake for January, right? Endings and beginnings. Um, so that's something worth thinking about too. Um, all right. So this topic in general, this idea of letting go, terminal patience, um, I don't know, there's a variety of ways we can think about or approach this topic, different perspectives we can take. So what are some? What come to mind? Like what are different, what's the phrasing here as a, as a guiding I phrase? Know, epistemology is right. Even what are different thematic elements, different patterns you saw in the Gawande piece itself um, and different perspectives he's using to approach hospice care, end of life care, letting go. Like what are the different, yeah, paradigms, perspectives, or kind of theoretical, it's too abstract. <laughs> How is he conceiving of this topic? What does he say? Yeah. Uh, things like probably, uh, probably one of the biggest things I know is in the articles that like patients who chose like not to pursue aggressive treatments and like, and so like, sort of give up on trying to uh, trying to find a cure and basically like a focus on every hospital care focusing on like making the remaining time they have kind of like as they as high quality as possible and of like uh, living longer living longer and having a better and like having a better a quality of life towards the end of their lives than patients who who didn't and that like another important thing I noticed was that their families like and the families of patients who pursued hospice care had less depression after the fact than, and then like families who tried everything and still failed. Yeah, really good. So there's so much in what Hannah just said. Certainly a question of values. Where do, you, do your values lie in end of life care? Um, certainly he's kind of making the point that there is a problem if the only value is prolonging life, prolonging life, doing everything possible um, when certain, a lot of these patients that have absolute terminal inoperable um, cancers, um, that end of life time can be muddled or kind of filled with really invasive surgical procedures rather than a questioning of what do I value? How do I want to spend my time? Um, 
Absolutely. So that's like a value judgment. And also I really want to think about caregivers. They are key to this. Um, it is an extraordinary experience to be a caregiver in this kind of situation. And that's again, a very health humanities idea is not just focusing on the patient, but how are they actually embedded, you know, in their network? How are their familial support factoring into this? Why is it important to consider it's just kind of like psychological somatic implications of being so near death and kind of assisting someone in their transition from life to death effectively, especially loved ones. Yeah, we can shift. All right. Um, yeah, all right, this is obnoxious, but I'm just gonna keep doing it for the recording. Do you wanna take over the history? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of thought, I know this was like a what's in my pocket kind of question. We'll show you the different interpretations and uh, paradigms and perspectives we're thinking of that Gawanda uses to approach this topic of letting go. But one is certainly historical. Um, I know he doesn't go into it too much, but it's worth noting just how, I guess, distinct like our current biomedical moment is even from like a hundred years ago. Kind of like what John Oberlander was saying, even recent presidents, like they had heart attacks and they were like bed rest, you know, you're fine. Or they, you know, got like an infection and died really, really quickly. So this whole idea of being kind of hooked up to monitors, having extremely invasive end of life care procedures, I'm forgetting the exact patient's names, but the ones who didn't necessarily opt for um, hospice treatment, but are instead kind of getting like forcibly intravenous nutrition, their lungs compressed, kind of everything, every vital organ or element of the body being taken over by machines because their bodies just kind of aren't, they're shutting down and they are dying. Um, so of course this entity is so different from how dying operated in the past. Um, it just is. And it really, we'll kind of get to this, but it gets into very kind of never let me go territory, this idea that we've advanced so far and we have all these life-saving procedures, but have we stopped to consider the ethics, the values, um, and what is at stake when it's so difficult for doctors and patients to have those conversations of you know, technically we do have life-saving procedures, but do you want them considering you are terminal, um, your organs are shutting down, there is absolutely no chance, you know, maybe they have like six or eight months to live, absolutely no chance you're going to come through this and that you're going to get better, kind of what happens then. Um, so yeah, I know we can just think of, it's impossible to think of history without basically a philosophy of history, and I'm not asking for specific historical moments, but just given what you know, even from like pop history, um, what is different between kind of dying in the past and dying now? Yeah. Perfect. Here, I should give you this. This is gonna be so relevant to this lecture. Okay, now this is too much pressure. Um, yeah, I'm taking a death and commemoration in the Middle Ages and early modern times class right now. And so a lot of it is like the Ars Moriendi, which is um, basically since uh, it was like how to die well. And a lot of it was very religious. Like you had to have like certain things. Like you had to be around your family. You had to um, like go without like being scared of death or like trying to like escape death because at that point it was inevitable. And so the perfect death is like how Mary, the um, the Virgin Mary died. And that was like a basis for a lot of it. And to express this to the people, there was, it's an art history class. And so, um, yeah, they painted and the book, the famous book is Ars Moriendi something. And um, what else? Okay, yeah. I think of anything, but to summarize, you're saying there was an art of death, there were death rituals, and even there was a convert, like, it's so amazing, there was a conversation then, what is a good death? Can you think of any equivalent in our time? Like, do we have those kinds of conversations in our current moment? My knee-jerk reaction would be to say no. We have an extremely death-denying culture. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say, like, this is so weird, um, that I don't think we have those conversations, and I was thinking... It's funny because the very end of that, How to Die, there's this book called How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger, and it's about like going vegan and curing cancer and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that's really interesting because I think there's like a ton of literature 
like self-help books like this is how you can like pull yourself out of like a terminal illness or you know hear all these success stories these miracle stories where like there I don't think there is very much conversation on like how to die well mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah how to retain your values your dignity I mean certainly in this country until just recently physician assisted suicide was you know, illegal, Dr. Kevorkian, the Dr. Death from, I think, maybe the 90s, but he went to prison for a while um, for physician-assisted suicide, which I think is kind of in keeping with, we'll say Western culture, but maybe American culture being very death-denying the idea. And you can kind of hear this with um, cancer rhetoric. It's all about finding a battle and you're trying to survive it, which also kind of implies if you don't, you've lost the battle. But we have very, that kind of like contentious, aggressive oppositional attitude towards death, right? It can only be fought. It can never kind of be accommodated or seen as existing within life or even alongside it. Um, that makes me think real quick, yeah, just, to, just to go off that. Um, yeah, Susan Sontag especially really pushes against that, that military metaphor we have regarding disease and regarding death. And yeah, it's very problematic in terms of this idea of even, even the euphemisms we use in obituaries, like they lost, they, they lost the battle. To, to this disease, yeah. Um, and just the idea of the history, like this notion of just because we can do something, we can delay death or prolong life to uh, an extreme end, like, should we, right? That's kind of the debate, but yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah, um, also thinking historically, um, sorry, um, I'm, I'm actually writing a like research paper on palliative care for a different class, um, but there was also like the case of Karen Quinlan in the 70s, um, she, like died or, or like fell comatose and she was brain dead. Um, and like the doctors wanted to keep her alive, but her family didn't want to keep her alive. And um, they essentially, like, cause she was, a, she was an adult um, and her parents fought to get like guardianship over her um, legally so that they could take her off a ventilator cause they knew that was what she wanted, but it was not ever legally expressed. Um, so we had this, establishment of the right to die in the 70s but there's been very little policy since then surrounding death so and like we're choosing our own death yeah i feel like when i was when probably when we were growing up it was terry shivo was the big case of yeah someone that was um completely brain dead and was kept alive on ventilators yeah i guess the opposite she was directly kept alive and then i think jeb bush got involved it was like a whole thing um but i think it really is a testament that like we don't have a lot of good codes, language, policies, and just guides for how to, how to die ourselves, but also how to kind of assist people we love and how to conceptualize death being in some ways kind of the most normal part of life or the most expected, the most integral part of life. It's what makes life meaningful, really. How to talk about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, one could argue like our culture is very youth-centered and just very... Uh, wants those blinders on regarding like this fact of uh, one of the fundamental facts of human existence is the inevitability of death. Mm-hmm. And our culture really doesn't isn't comfortable talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. What's one more? Can, just off the cuff, can you guys think of metaphors, idioms, or any kind of phrases around death or dying that we use that we could kind of like dissect? Yeah, Janae. Uh huh. Sure. So we use we refer to death in very exaggerated, hyperbolic cases. But how do we actually refer to death itself? Yes. To the death. (laughs) I'm dying laughing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's so much in what Abby just said, and this is why Paul and I study language and love literature. Like, the word even passed or passed on, whatever, like, what is that? And it kind of implies travel, mobility, movement, a journey. Um, Like, all that is interesting to consider next to death, which can be seen as sometimes very static, you know, stasis, lack of movement, all those things. Yeah, so it's maybe our language is kind of like, deliberately trying to get away from that or trying to, you know, prolong this sense of 
we're all on a path. Life is a journey and it kind of continues on. Yeah. I was going to say that one. I love idioms. I have no idea. Someone look it up. I mean, they all come, they all have etymologies. They all come from somewhere. But yeah, where on earth, like why? Why is that a phrase to kick the bucket? And this is very active. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Um, Angel? We also say, like, put to rest, or lay to rest. Put to rest. Yeah, and what does that, like, what does rest imply? Sleep. Yeah, I feel like I've made this point too many times with my recitations, but there is a weird continuum between sleeping, being uh, horizontal in a sick bed, and death. Um, I think those images get kind of played with each other. Yeah, Taha. Right. And like that is, I don't know, kind of brutalist language. Um, it begs the question of like, why? Why is that a repeated idiom? Why is that a phrase? Kieran? Well, I'm going to remember that forever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Those are both absolutely fascinating etymological histories. Yeah, yeah really terrific. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I think we're in danger of lingering too long on one side, so I might move forward, keep thinking about differences between historical. I know I did this slide, but do you want to talk through this? Um, yeah, I can. Um, so, yeah, I wanna, we wanted to bring your attention back to, like, that the relationship between the, the first and the Porter piece, right? So Lillian first had this very progressive um, kind of traditional narrative of the history of medicine, and then Roy Porter's piece had kind of more ambivalent account, looking at maybe a series of trade-offs, right? Um, so we were thinking about um, different examples of dying in this, you know, we're in this, this biomedically advanced and, and really a, a world in which we tend to prioritize just the biomedical approach. Um, but can we look at this, an example that kind of supports first claim, this idea that we've greatly improved, we've advanced um, over the last two centuries? Or alternatively, um, can we think of an example that leans more towards Roy Porter's idea of these series of trade-offs? Um, I think I think it's possible for for either one. So let's let you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this interesting faith that so many of us have and in the advancements, in the scientific, in the progress, this progress narrative, right? No, we can cure this, we can fight this, we can beat this, um, when the reality can often be it is a series of trade-offs or thinking back to Cassell, um, even just going back to chemotherapy. Like I always think, 
you know, it's easy to look back a few hundred years ago and think about like bloodletting and, and how barbaric surgery seems. And I always wonder like 200 years from now, are they going to be saying, you know, yeah, they used to inject you with this poison um, that almost killed you, but it killed the, the cancer first, hopefully. Um, yeah. I did not know that. And there is a trade-off. There's the bizarre sense that when you go to the hospital, you're actually really near like super bugs, infections, things that are extremely life-threatening, even though you're in a like a life-saving place, uh, which is again just because of biomedical advancement. We have um, the bacteria has evolved to combat, you know, what's the what's MRSA? It's like methylin resistant. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. That is an absolutely great example of series of trade-offs. A lot of medication, certainly one that kind of, kind of comes to mind right away is um, antipsychotics, which are very regularly prescribed, but they can cause such profound weight gain that you can become um, diabetic. So again, and very much a, a trade-off. Yeah. Um, And sometimes it's again, or death. <laughs> right. Or, or just the actual condition it's treating, right? Like, or yeah. the side effect may be the illness you already have. Um, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, even just going back to the way diseases evolve, right? Like they have a progressive narrative too. I'm thinking um, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, right? We treated TB and then basically that's led to the, the bug um, adapting to where it can now, it's resistant to many of the drugs. And now there's XDRTB, which is extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. Um, so it's this trade-off where we're curing or helping some people, but also developing these, yeah, these super bugs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say that too. It was almost what I talked about with the modern and the life narrative of like how um, we have like a very complicated drug resistant whole culture. And that, an like an example of the progressive narrative But it's really interesting, although I'm on my mind, like how like, in the US maternal mortality has gone up so much. So like maybe there's more and like that's not in the study that I'm doing right now, but it was just for uh, the Indian mothers and drug resistant women. But mm -hmm. it's really interesting how the technology maybe allows the next one out for you know other different things that are like really progressive. Yeah, absolutely. And just for a moment, I do maybe want to if anyone can consider first, I mean, I think it's amazing. Always be uh, wary of progress narratives. Typically they can become insidious, but to make a point for, for first and for the idea that things effectively very much have gotten better, um, certainly maternal mortality, I know it's still quite high in this country being developed, but it's way less than it was, right? There were things like, I can't say it, but like peripheral fever uh, back in like the 18th and 19th century, which were physicians going from examining uh, women who had died in childbirth and not washing their hands and then touching women who had just given birth and obviously were open to infection and bleeding and they would develop a fever that killed them pretty much instantly or very, very quickly. So there is a way in which technological advancements, advancements in science has, you know, inevitably, undeniably positive effects. Yeah, on average, the lifespan, the human lifespan is has drastically increased. Granted, yes, there are, you know, huge inequities within that. But yeah, on average, it's increased, which in itself is causing other um, perhaps unforeseen um, issues. Um, and maybe that gets into our economic. Um, or the ethical, yeah. I, do, I also want to think about the strangeness of living in a time where you can receive a, a there's, this isn't a good way to put it, but like a death diagnosis or diagnosis of terminal, inoperable, you know, very short lifespan, and then you have to live with that knowledge. I feel like that also distinguishes our time, right? Because that's a profoundly psychologically stressful experience. If you remember Riggs, when she, it becomes really clear, like she's dying, her cancer is metastasizing, it's spreading, and Nurse John comes in and talks to her about being held by the bed. He's basically doing like crisis management, stress management. Um, so there is something very particular in our era where you, 
there's almost like the not the torture but the suffering of the knowing of the knowing for a long time and kind of the the waiting and the figuring out what to do i feel like that does distinguish our moment more so than in the past where you know like guade says like george washington got a throat infection and he's down within 24 hours like that's it yeah. it kind of reminded me of like modern genetic counseling with like things like high tend so like if there's something you can't really do but something you definitely get like down the line within 30 minutes so just like and like having to sign all the waivers to like acknowledge that like with getting like your genome read like you Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Just what happens when you're presented with this new kind of knowledge and awareness? Has anyone read um, Jean Paul Sartre's The Wall? I highly recommend it. It's about a, um, a prisoner of war basically waiting to be executed the next day, but he's just kind of confronting this nature of death. Yeah. Um, maybe we should. Yeah. that it's an issue in the United States that we have the highest rate of maternal mortality out of any developed country. So, and it mostly relates back to the way that we teach our medical students in that they're taught to try to receive the highest reimbursement that they can and reimbursement for conceptions are a lot higher than they are for like a natural birth. So they're getting reimbursed at a higher cost with C-sections. And then also with modern medicine, we use epidurals because we like try to make everything fast and efficient and convenient. And epidurals put babies more in distress. And then we have the development of fetal heart monitoring that like tells us that the baby's in distress. But then they're like, okay, yeah, we're gonna give you the next baby. So and then like C-section higher risk. I don't know. I thought it was all like relevant to this class because it's a lot of the way that med students are taught because it's what they teach their studies too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it dovetails, we'll get you one thing, but we're going into the economics approach um, to this issue, and that's absolutely a key element. I mean, it's a little Machiavellian, but sure, maybe there is a financial incentive to recommend a C-section over like a vaginal birth. Yeah. And then what happens again when we're privileging capital over human lives? Oh, yeah, so to kind of add to that, so like kind of in the logical first running question, it, so we like talked about how like the development of like maternal care and like our maternal needs, especially the development of a finite finite like kind of saving like a pilot birth and like knocking them out for three days, pulling the baby out. I don't know the name, but that's that's pretty much what it was. Mm -hmm. And then um coding the same system we have now. And even from sim from the simple, we talked about um birthing a very ritualistic birth as well as <coughs> fear and how it's something as simple as the positioning of the mother, how do we position her for the birth? And the way we position the mother during the birth is actually like one of the least efficient ways to like position the mother during birth. Like it's mm -hmm. one of the worst ways. Like know. on your back? On your back. Yeah. Are you know, supposed to like do most of You could be in a position to give birth, actually. Mm -hmm. So because it's you know, it's just something as simple as like just like you know, like pelvis and things like that. Your baby like naturally just stuff like that, just natural things that your body does to try to like push the baby out and make sure things are okay, like food and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. putting the mother on her back, it, it does a whole discussion. Absolutely, and you're highlighting like a central theme of this class, which is that medicine is cultural, right? It's completely subject to cultural norms, and those cultural norms might actually work against, you know, the, the best health outcome. Yeah, kind of like going along with what you were saying, like also on the topic like in sociology, and then the, um, the reason, like, primarily the, um, the maternal death rate or whatever is um, lower because of African American women, like, it's substantially that way. Um, and at the center, like, it was because um, of the stress that they're put under, like, their entire life. Like, it's not just, like, during pregnancy, it's, like, throughout their life, how that causes them to get, like, sober earlier, which is, like, the most not great thing. Yeah, these different cultural um, or systemic forces or economic forces end up affecting um, affecting the death rate, affecting how we even interpret um, 
death. Um, all right, so historical approach is one way. Another way we can think about it is this economic approach, right? Um, Gawande begins his article kind of framing this idea of the soaring cost of healthcare is the greatest threat to the country's long-term solvency. Um, a quarter of all Medicare spending is for five is for the five percent of patients who are in their final months. And again, just an average, someone um, uh, with terminal breast cancer, an average of sixty-three thousand dollars during the final six months of life. So, I chose this picture too because we're thinking about economics and money, but resources in general, not just um, money, but labor or um, and also time, right? Just an investment in time, which ultimately is what letting go is all about we all have a limited amount of time left and some people are presented with that knowledge. Um, so that raises this question a lot of time of just what is the quote unquote best use of resources? Um, you know, he kind of raises this. Should we be as a culture, as a nation, um, spending this kind of money um, on these individuals uh, or forcing these kinds of procedures on people and or should families be spending this kind of money or resources um, during this time? Again, it's a, it's a harsh, it can feel like a harsh way to approach it, but it is a reality, something that needs to be brought up and thought about. Um, so I don't know, how do you react to these questions? What's the best use of resources or how do we even define the word best, right? There's a, a variety of ways of thinking about this. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that I was discussing with this major was that he was talking about the distribution of like the, the length of life after clinical diagnosis for cancer, right? Through like a long tail. And so like statistically, like that long tail is very unlikely. Um, but a lot of people, like you said earlier, have a lot of faith in the medical system, the biomedical system. And so they bet their lives and a lot of their money on that little tail. And so it, it did make me think about like betting basically because like the odds are very small, but you get really enticed by like the grand prize of living life. And so yeah, that idea of just this, this idea of the gamble, this idea of I'll be the one, I'll be the one to win the lottery, the grand prize. Um, I, and also, and I think that's also, I mean, A, I think we just have a tendency to do that. We all think that we are going to be the one who beats the system um, or the disease, but also I think ingrained into that, driving us towards that as other factors, just of you can't give up or your family doesn't want you to give up or a society ultimately thinks like, what are you doing? You have to fight, right? Especially in our culture, never give up, always fight. You can overcome it. Yeah. Yeah, so prolonging, um, extending life at least to get some form of closure or some um, important event, right? That's definitely one like way in which we can think about uh, uh, justifying or, or the value of extending life. Um, yeah. Sixty-three thousand dollar, you know, end of life, life saving care that just simply can't work. 
But that was something that they brought up in the article is just like how much money is saved by having a camera on the street. Because you're gonna have these guys either saying like yes I yes or no, like I want breathing tubes, feeding tubes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um but also just like accepting that the end might be coming and like kind of saying goodbye because I think you also mentioned a lot of people, you know, like when they're making decisions for someone else, right? Just to put them on life saving measures because like they're like, well, I haven't said goodbye. I haven't said this to you. Like you want to say to me. So it's just a decision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the last lesson too is like saying that like you value the person and you want so much to talk about like value or like even like illness extending outside of like one body and so how like Maybe the best use of your resources is to try to prolong the fact that, like, like because you value those things, you want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Or those people value you being in their life, and mm -hmm. therefore they're not the one who is trying to make the most of you. Even if you don't have those things. Yeah, but you're you know highlighting how there can be conversations that can be can ask people like, what are your values? What do you value? How do you We want to make feeding tubes for this guy. And so that implies to me that I want to, I guess, put this baby in here and show how this is going to be bad. And I guess, like, I think the line they didn't talk about the fact that, like, the person you want before you are sick is their guess of being the person you saw when you were sick. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just kind of reconcile those two principles is just like what we get to do. Yeah, that's a beautiful point. Yeah. Um, so important and so just highlights the difficulty of doing this kind of work, but also the need to probably discuss it more. But certainly if yeah, if everyone's had experience with hospice, hospice care, a lot of times they'll say something like the person, they're not there anymore. You know, like hallucinations are not uncommon, not recognizing who you are, who your loved ones are is not uncommon. So yeah, does that person is that the same person that they were their entire life? Thinking about like what's the value of a person, I usually value a person based on like the, the relationship you have with them, the connection you have with them. So I feel like in a sense, I kind of need like the selflessness of like prolonging life, just because like you want to get that closure, you want to have like those feelings for yourself, and then kind of if someone's like in pain or if someone's like obviously not the person that they, that they wanted, like. Then it's kind of hard for you to just like say like what they could go to to make the same thing because it's like you're not going to know where to go. So still the, the value would be to just like not be bothered by that. Yeah, letting go can be both letting go of one's life and also letting go of others. Yeah. Um, I feel like I saw another hand, but maybe maybe not. All right. I'm gonna shift to the yeah, I'm looking at the time. We might for time's sake. I'm not going to really discuss this. It's worth highlighting again. The economic <laughs> side of end of life care is so pertinent and needs to be discussed because we live in America. Um, if you just turn on the news and the new debates, um, obviously there's going to be an election. This is a central topic. It is something we're all going to have to deal with. I think there is a reasonable consensus that the way this country delivers health care is so disorganized. And so much, there's so much inequality um, that something has to change. So. I guess it's worth, I mean, I loved this, the John Oberlander talk. I hope anyone that's interested in social medicine will take a class with him. But I'm curious if anyone else was surprised when reading Gawande's piece that he foregrounds the economic side. Like, that's the very beginning. It's not a philosophical approach. It's not a moral approach of, like, how do we, you know, have dignity um, in our final hours? How do we encourage people to kind of lead life in 
you know, as conscious and autonomous way as possible and kind of have a good death, it's economics. It's, it's really, really expensive to, you know, have end of life care. Like, was that surprising to anyone? Um, like, what does it mean that we do have kind of like a knee jerk reaction to think of extremely existential, moral, philosophical issues dying? I mean, dying is medical, but it's also philosophical, it's moral. Um, what does it mean that like we go so quickly to the economic, like that's our default, is like how much is it gonna cost? Can we make an argument? Um, can we justify our argument on economics rather than, you know, a philosophy, frankly? Yeah, Trish, I think it makes a lot of sense to start out with the economics. Okay. Um, as much as we don't want to think about it, like money is something that is, yeah. you know, at the forefront of it, most people think. Absolutely. I think it's also very helpful to start out with something that's very physical and physical and you can touch that. Mm -hmm. Like money is very centralized, it's just a number that they can attack. Whereas more moral and more philosophical or debatable, it's just harder to get a concrete on hard and fast facts. Whereas with money, you can just like the difference and mm -hmm. give a case for it. Absolutely. So it might be a little bit easier to build the case because I would say letting go is a persuasive essay, isn't it? Like he does seem to have an argument and he does seem to be, you know, convincing us of a certain point, which is, you know, not having such intense end of life care going into hospice. Yeah, it ties back to this health humanities concept that like you can't teach things like empathy and, you know, like having morals and like creating your own moral code. That's something that's like up to the individual to decide and mm -hmm develop for themselves so like it wouldn't be as persuasive to say like well you know I believe that like that death should be like this because it is the most personal decision you can have and like the and it's not something that you can change for everyone but you can change you know the economic aspect of it absolutely yeah Michael um I'm just gonna say like it was a little unsettling for me to start like with an economics approach mm -hmm. because I think that <clears throat> At least when I think about uh, like looking at our country's problems, like what we spend it on, end of life care, I think about the fact that it's really easy to look at it from this large scope that we're spending so much money on this, but these decisions were never made with that kind of scope. They're always made like within a family, like with one person and another. And I think it's very easy to say, oh, we're spending so much money on this, but when it's your loved one, when it's your parent, your child, like. Money is the last thing that you think of. So I just I think like we talk a lot about in this class about going back into that one on one encounter and focusing on that interaction. And I think it's important to like not get too big sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Because kind of like uh, what is it? No. Spencer. What? Spencer. <laughs> yeah, to Spencer's point, um, this is one of the most personal experiences, you know, of all time. Um, yeah, and it might not be I don't know, appropriate to expand out to the macro level and lose that individual experience. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, I was just going to say that I think one of the biggest issues that we face is that it brings up the question of who then can afford all this life care and then who then has to pay for so many months. Absolutely. Um, especially with like the United States having disproportionate effects in terms of minority populations, African Americans, mm -hmm. um, and that like they generally would not, like those people would not have even just the option of that. So the conversation would then kind of, I guess, shift in terms of people who are able to afford to pay people with their social economic, social economic status, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like an unfair way of keeping other groups of the conversation because like these are underlying social issues that can be addressed. Whereas like health itself, sometimes if you have like a predisposition for like a genetic like complication for breast cancer, for example, or if conditions that you're living in make you more susceptible to these, like certain diseases, yeah, really important point. And one I don't think Gawande touches on really at all, but absolutely, um, healthcare is unequally distributed. It is an undeniable fact that if you are underinsured or not insured, you have poorer health outcomes and you die earlier. Absolutely. Um, and if you have better insurance, typically you are going to live longer and have better health outcomes. Um, that's an undeniable part. End of life, life-saving care might simply be financially out of reach. 
And so what does it mean when we put a premium on that, we privilege that when it's completely inaccessible to a huge portion of like our fellow citizens? Yeah, unless they, they can't even enter the conversation or the debate, um, much less even have access to it. Um, so yeah, maybe we can. Um, so yeah, so ultimately, I mean, we can look at this essay as he's kind of uh, looking at the biomedical approach, right? The goal of medicine is to prolong life, to delay death versus a more health humanities approach or, or maybe a more ethical approach, just uh, more focused on the quality of life. And I think I, I'll read this key quote. The hard question we face then is not how we can afford this system's expense. It is how we can build a healthcare system that will actually help dying patients achieve what's most important to them at the end of their lives. Um, so these questions get to two things. We've kind of touched on the one, thinking about the historical approach, like what does dying even mean now? At one point he says, like, I'm not even sure what that, that word means because of these new um, cultural and, and technological advances. Um, does anybody want to, like, what's your response to that? Or what was your thoughts when you read that section? What does it even mean to die? Or how is it harder to define now than perhaps it used to be or once was? Thank you. 
actually know the situation and then take it from you to the court if you were to get that outcome. So yeah, just be aware of that. So if you are planning on that week, then you want to be prepared to get that test done. And if you are already boarding your plane, you want to be prepared to check in with people. And then after every vacation, like if you're ever going to travel, it's essential that the patient should be alive and well. And so at some point you may need to start, you are basically replacing everything, you know, all the new organs and then you have to replace them with the new ones. So you do your first every time you come to Seattle, so it kind of gives us an idea of where you are lying right now. Yeah, these pretty these pretty abstract concepts. Yeah, like asking what does it mean? What does dying mean? Yeah, inherently asks us what does living mean or what does it mean to be a human? Um, the same way that like thinking about disease forces us to think about how do we define what it means? Um, yeah, to be healthy. And the idea too that like there's a point at which you change enough to where you're not you anymore. Um, I, I love that thought experiment, but like there's, there's a, a continuum, right? Because I mean, in theory, you all will leave this room, you won't be the same people you were when you entered, right? Because at the very least, hopefully you've learned something or thought about something in the last hour and 15 minutes. And if nothing else, you've aged a little bit, right? We're constantly changing. Um, I mean, time's always moving forward. Yeah, yeah, some more than others. Um, but time's, all, you know, so this sense of there's, where do we draw the line between suddenly you've changed to the point where you're no longer you or you're no longer fully human or fully alive or you're in the process of dying? Um, next slide is just never let me go. We only have five minutes left. So I'm curious, just really open-ended question. Because we are, we read this thing on letting go. Maybe if we take Tawande's argument seriously, what, what would you consider a good way to kind of usher someone through life to death? Like what are ways to encourage a good death? What are ways to <coughs> maintain quality within mental life care? Like what are your ideas? How do you encourage someone to kind of leave the earth in, I don't know, as best, as best as way possible or with morals attached. Yeah, um, I feel like part of us too is sometimes being physically comfortable with like not being pain. Absolutely. So like, a lot of it I think also has to do with like thinking about your situation. Like my grandpa only passed away eight years ago and it took two of us and he was in a lot of pain like up until the end because he didn't want to be on the way He was really at peace with dying. Like he sort of this is so my dad when he was with him, he asked, like, are you scared to die? Like he was like, I'm not so scared, but mm -hmm. um and he said, No, like I I'm in pain, like I just want to get people through this. And I think the fact that he like said that, like it was normal to all of us that he said that, but he didn't really want to ask for it, like when he was comfortable with that, like yeah, I think it absolutely is too. And I think it's profound that your family had that conversation, you know? People can act, death can be such an elephant in the room kind of situation where people will not acknowledge it. But there's something very kind of profound and real to just ask someone who is dying, like, are you okay? How do you feel about it? And what's the reaction you make there? It's a very personal conversation to have with death. Oh my gosh, you're so hands. I would say anyone who hasn't spoken, maybe in the very back. Yeah, um, I saw I somebody stand up, but now, face. yeah, Olivia. Um, Helping people access things they really want them to do earlier in life, so like going to school too for some reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like for example, my grandfather, um, my grandparents, um, they were very into the Patriots a lot, and like that was something that he wasn't even that proud of. Like, he was like, I don't know, I'm going to the earth and stuff like that. Like, I'm going to stop for you. Um, but like it's something he really enjoyed, and then once he realized that he had to do it, like he still had to do it, um, it was, you know, it was just like one small thing, and then it became about. And some people have like bigger goals, like I want to see this particular piece of art, do this particular thing. But I think it's really important to be ask people what do you want to do mm -hmm. and try to make sure that it happens. Absolutely. Like patient centered care. Oh, I had something else, but I forgot it. Oh, I think I just say too that caregiving is so much more than like helping them with morphine, with you know, shifting out of the bed. It's you know. Asking what they value and then trying to make that happen, yeah. right? Like that's that's caregiving way beyond um, treating the body, you know, just doing a biomedical thing. I think um, asking someone what they 
feel like they have to lose um, is especially important. So like exposing those concerns can kind of help by even addressing them if you can, um, kind of help someone continue on like the natural journey that is life to ultimately ending in your death. Um, but yeah, I think it does help a lot. Yeah. These are all phenomenal responses. Maybe one more? Yeah, no one. I think it's important for the patient um, not to feel guilty before he or she uh, dies. And that kind of takes the whole family to really come to terms with the, the death of the patient because like, it's like the family's like, their loved ones are like, please don't die, don't leave me and all that. That'll put the patient under like a lot of stress and anxiety to want to pass away. Yeah, going back to this idea that we tend to treat death like a defeat. So instead, you know, yeah. Um, there, there's a few slides on here we didn't get to, so I'd encourage you to, I uh, will, I'll make this live later today and check out what we didn't get to, but yeah, I think, that's an important one. I think if you go one back, is, yeah, you we're open to come, like definitely still come talk to us as much as I'm looked over. I'm sorry. We have spent two weeks talking about dying and <laughs> all of this. It's been an incredible emotional journey, I think for Paul and I, so thank you for going on it with us. Go and do something fun. Enjoy your life <laughs> these next couple days. And have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, travel safe. <laughs>